Good morning, Covenant. Are you glad to be warm and dry? Yeah, great. Welcome. If you are a guest with us, my name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to invite you, as Pastor Chris did earlier, to just reach out in front of you, grab one of these blue cards. Uh, there are ways, uh, covenantexperience.com, for example, that you can connect with us online. Uh, but this is also another way. You can drop it in the offering plate at the end of the service. Let us know if there are ways we can pray for you. Let us know who you are. Uh, sometimes people are a little bit reticent to reach out to a church because you're afraid we're going to try to sell you something. We have no used cars in the back. And you can unsubscribe anytime you want. But if you'd like to go down that uh, journey with us and learn a little bit more about Covenant, we'd love to just be able to send you some things from time to time and be able to be easily get, out, get in touch with you if you, in fact, want us to do that. So be, uh, just be aware of that. And if you want to fill that out or, again, go to the, the, the website and, and do it there. We are in a series. This is week three of an eight-week series on parenting. And I'm delighted to see you here. I'm delighted to see and walk in the halls with folks that even aren't parents or maybe aren't parents yet. Statistically, a high number of us are going to be parents one day. But even for those who may never be parents, there's a responsibility that the church has collectively and corporately to raise children to the greater glory of God. And we've been spending these early weeks talking about how the developmental stages of life. What do you do like when they're still in their diapers? What does that look like? when they're toddling around the house and you're trying to keep them from sticking their finger in a socket or running with scissors. What does that look like? Today's going to be probably the most challenging of that. I feel a little bit intimidated doing this. I'll be honest with you for a couple of reasons. Number one is out of our three children, two of them are still at home and still fit within this phase. So Amy and I aren't done yet. We're along this journey with you, but also there's a gap. And it's an ever-widening gap between what God's Word teaches about human development at this teenage stage of life and what we have experienced in our culture. For example, there isn't a person alive right now who, hasn't, who has lived prior to the recognition of a stage of development that our culture now just reflexively refers to as adolescence. And it's interesting to me, when sociologists speak of that term, they speak of its invention. And I, I, I appreciate the, the intellectual honesty, at least. This is not something that really in the broad sense of history has even been understood this way. And, and so the, it, there's this, basically adolescence is defined as this stage between childhood and adulthood. So there's this moment in life when you're a child and you're under the authority of your parents and you're a minor or you're whatever, you know, various cultures and nations may define that different ways. Then you're an adult, you're functioning, you're on your own. There's this in-between space now where you're neither a child nor are you an adult, you're an adolescent. Well, Scripture actually calls that youth, but the Bible's understanding of youth is not the same as this contemporary understanding of adolescence, and that makes this one of the most difficult series uh, parts of the series to preach. And, and given the fact that we're talking about raising teenagers today, that's probably appropriate, don't you think? There are easier things to do in the world. And this one is getting harder. And furthermore, this one's taking longer. Further complicating that is our culture keeps throwing things in that make this more and more unclear with every successive day. Some of the more stark reminders of that, Glenn Stanton will remind us about next week, and so you don't want to miss his coming. But, but let me give you just one example of what I'm talking about. And if you are willing to admit, listen, we, we value our older adults here. We actually believe that where there is a gray hair, there is a crown of glory. We believe what the scriptures say about that. So don't be ashamed. If you were born prior to 1945, can I see your hand? Nobody else look around. All right, we got a few of you still with us, and that's awesome. And, and so here's the deal. Your generation... You became a functional adult on average, some of you took longer, some of you maybe not quite as long depending on your raising, at around the age of 18. Now, why was that? Well, that's because high school ended when you were 18. Very few people went to college in this generation, or if you did, maybe that happened later in life. So you, you left high school, you went to work, you got a job, some of you got a spouse. Not long after that, some of you even got children, you bought a home. You're adulting. Like by the time you're the age our oldest is now, you already had all that and you were moving. Like you were on track to do that. Now, your children, the baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1964. Let me see your hands. A few more of you. Yeah. 
All right, you guys, it took you a little longer, 22. That was the average age of a baby boomer becoming a functional adult. Now, there's some good reasons for this. College education became more commonplace, more available during this time, and so more of you went, more of you got a college degree. That's not something that's a necessity, but generally speaking, more educated populace can, you know, that's not a bad thing. It's really not. And, and so it extended your, your time of, of not really being a fully functioning adult about four years. The problem, though, is along with the advent of the commonplace nature of college education came the commonplace nature of fraternities and sororities and puking off balconies and all that kind of stuff, right? And, and so along with that, go get your education seemed to be this sort of cultural encouragement of you can remain a child just a little bit longer. And then you had kids. That was my generation. We're my Gen X brothers and sisters. 1965 to 1978, 79, somewhere in there, right? Our average age of leaving childhood and entering adulthood was 27. I don't know, likely because of the advent of the Atari 2600. Maybe that's where it came from. <laughs> but but we, we loved our video games. We loved playing. We, and, of course, we went. To, a lot of us went to college as well. We did a lot of hey, no sin in gaming, all right? My boys are into it. it it's, it's not wrong, all right? But, but it, it can, like a lot of other things, lead to compulsive behavior if you're not careful, and it can lead you down a path where you, you never really grow up. And so you kind of want to watch that. So Gen X, 27, then came the millennial generation. This was the generation of my younger brother, born 1978, 79 to 1998. Where are my millennials at? Yeah, I got some millennial brothers and sisters. You, on average, reached adulthood at the age of 29. Now, we're in this phase of life where we see Gen Z, and we don't have all the data on them yet. There's not been, they haven't lived long enough to have longitudinal data. The oldest of this generation is 24 years of age, but we are told, demographers are telling us, trends are indicating that the average Gen Zer, and that's all three of my children, will not reach functional adulthood until they're sometime in their early 30s. All right, so I want you to think about this, all right? I, I didn't give, I'm not telling you what should be. These are just facts, okay? We went from 18 to 30 plus in four generations. Some of that's not bad. Some of it, there are good reasons for it, okay? But there's a widening gap. Have you noticed? Adolescence is getting longer and it's getting more confusing. So we've created a swamp, basically. We've told children from about the time they hit puberty until whenever they're able to pay their own mortgage and moms and dads look at each other and go, I can't believe we're here, right? And, but in that in-between time, we don't know how long it's supposed to be. We don't really have any, any informed, agreed-upon cultural mile markers for that. So this swamp between puberty and adulthood has no clear cultural direction this is where we need to return to the scriptures. Now, I'm going to start with 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, as each has received a gift, and all of us are endowed with gifts, all of us have promise, all of us have purpose, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So take what you have, take what God has given you, and use that to serve other people. It's a pretty basic Christian principle. To do that, you have to be able to function as an adult. And to adult, you know something's bad when we've made a verb out of it. We need a very different picture of this period of life that our culture calls adolescence. Let me tell you what that means. Just go to Google today and type teens in the space bar and let Google finish the sentence for you. That alone will be rather depressing. Teens and drinking is what comes up. Teens and social media. Teens missing teen's bedroom, teen suicide. The expectations, there, there really aren't any. Go ahead and type in teens and expectations. I dare you, okay? It gets better. From the ages of 10 to 14, here they are, according to one article that I read. Number one, make your bed every day without being asked. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Number two, clean your room once per week with help from parents. It's just we, dude. I don't know. Yeah. Number three, do a daily chore like taking out the trash. And number four, if you are learning how to drive, make sure the gas gauge stays at least above a quarter of a tank. Now, th this, these are people the same age group. I'm not 
I, I'm not, this is not a critical message. I just want us to get a sense of the reality. And so if you are one of our teens and you're sitting there beside mom and dad and they're tempted to elbow you, tell mom and dad to hold off a minute, okay? Because I got something positive coming for you. But I do want you to see the stark reality between that situation and the founding of the country. George Washington surveyed all of Culpeper County, Virginia at the age of 14. Clara Barton, before she founded the American Red Cross, learned how to be a nurse under a doctor's supervision after her brother fell out of a tree at age 11. This is what it used to mean to be a teenager. I'm not saying that's something we have to necessarily go back to. I'm saying that in the current environment compared with that one, even in the church, you can disobey 1 Peter 4.10 and nobody says a word for to you because the culture's infected with low expectations. So here's my, my question today, not just for parents, but, but for the teens that are sitting out here as well. What would it look like if everybody in this room decided that those in our church family at this stage of life need to rebel against those low expectations? What happens then? What's the result Okay? You know what we do. You know what our culture does. You know what our culture calls those people? 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds that actually do this stuff? You know what they call them? An old soul and a young body. You know what? Maybe that's just supposed to be normal. Right? Let's think about that for a minute. Is it possible that maybe the, those prodigies or those people, those, those young people that are actually getting up there and getting it done, and, and we're, well, they're just an old, no, maybe Maybe they're what God intended. Let me, let me throw that out there just as a thought. And furthermore, let me ask this. What if we remember that the perfect picture of humanity is actually the person of Jesus, and we emulate him? And we don't have a detailed biography of Jesus' life, but we do know that from the age of 12 up until around the age of 30, there's a summary at the end of Luke chapter 2. He increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, as parents, grandparents, godparents, friends of parents who have offspring at this stage of life, we want to see that from our teens. We want to see them do what Jesus did here. We have to acknowledge and respond to what happens in our children, though, if that's, if that's going to happen. We need to be there. We need to actively parent during this stage of life. And so let me back up to verse 43 of Luke 2. Let's read this story again. Let's pick up something of the context so that we can understand what Mary and Joseph even were having to deal with. And their kid was perfect. All right? So, so let's start with verse 43. When the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple. Anybody ever lost your kid at the mall or in a park or Disney or somewhere? 15 minutes, 20 minutes, your life is over, isn't it? You're just in full-blown panic mode. Moms, dads, take heart. Even to those of you with little bitty small children that this hasn't happened to yet, but that moment is probably coming. Just remember that the mother and adopted dad of the son of the living God lost that sucker for three days. You're doing fine, okay? It's going to be all right. They lost him, and then they find him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at this understanding and his answers. And, of course, the only thing mom and dad can think about is, why have you treated us so? Okay. There are going to be times in your teenager's life when you're going to correct them and they need correction. Moms, dads, by the time our children get to this age, there are also going to be times where we got to stop for a minute and think before we speak, because there may be something underneath the surface there we don't yet see that is deeper and better than what we think we're looking at, because we want to look at them, you know, like they're still five, and they're not. They're 14, they're 12, they're 13. This is Jesus. Jesus never sinned. So the issue is with mom being exasperated with Jesus, right? The issue, sometimes the issue is the teen, sometimes the issue is an exasperated parent that doesn't stop long enough to understand there's something deeper going on here. Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, 
why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And her mother, his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Now, let's admit, being honest with the intent of the text, there are things here unique to the person of Jesus. This story confirms his own keen awareness in his own identity as the son of God, the priority that he has now following the father's path that was intended for him. But, but within this narrative, there's some commonalities between Jesus at this stage of development and the things that ought to be true of our own kids at, at this same age. Developmental specialists tell us there's, there's two hallmarks of adolescence. The first is physical maturity. They're going to get bigger. Their voice is going to change. They're going to have a sexual awakening. All that's going to happen. Second thing's going to happen is intellectual maturity. This stage of development launches the season of abstract thinking. And this is often what drives moms and dads crazy because when your kid was four, you knew he thought. All right, a four-year-old is capable of thinking, but a 14-year-old is capable of thinking about thinking. Okay? Something's happened to the brain. There's been a developmental stage that they've crossed, and now it's different, which means that that young person, for the very first time, while they're still living under your roof, is able to conceive of other minds, other ideas, other than what you've been spoon-feeding them all this time. The coexistence of all of those ideas in the same culture. And that results in what developmentalists call the experiment of the self. You've got a young lady. She's been told up until this point. And listen, that's very important. We talked about that last week, that when they're young, you build their sense of identity in them. That's good. And up until this point, that's what's happened. She's been told who she is. Now she recognizes, hey, I'm kind of the center of my own self-project. I'm the producer of my own drama here. And this intellectual development comes with physical development, and when you combine those together, it produces an initial point of separation. Even while they're living in your house, there's a point of separation. And listen to me carefully, moms, dad. Not only is that not wrong, not only is that okay, that is God-ordained, and we as moms and dads have absolutely no business short-circuiting what God has ordained, simply because we're uncomfortable with it simply because it puzzles us. Simply because what's happening is that, that young person is becoming an adult. Now, other side, for the teens that are in the room, they're not there yet, okay? They're not there yet, but that separation is good. Jesus himself, who had no sin, experienced this very separation, and the role of parents and guardians is to help them go in the right direction. Remember the the theme of this whole series, Psalm 127, 4. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. The, The aim is not to keep them in the quiver for as long as possible. The aim is to release the arrows, channel it in the right direction. And where Jesus is concerned, Luke tells us after the events, he went home and he was submissive to his parents. And that perfect submission resulted in perfect development mentally, Physically, socially, he grew, we're told in verse 52, in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This, if you've got a teenager living in your house, if you are five years or less from having a teenager in your house, like I talked to you about last week, this is your calling. This is my calling. It's our responsibility toward those young men and young women. We want to confound the expectations of the world that just says, let them go into the swamp let them define, good grief, let's, let them even decide what gender they are. Let them just do whatever. Don't give them any, just let them do whatever. And then whenever they decide to emerge out of the goo, whatever that is, just accept it, just affirm it. Just to, No, we, we've got to do better than that. Some cultural milestones need to be put in place. Some guidance needs to be given. And then a whole lot of freedom, that's the part that makes us uncomfortable sometimes, needs to be given within those channels. We've got to help them develop in the same three ways that the Son of God developed. So let's take those in, in reverse order, starting with the social. It says of Jesus, he, he grew in favor with God and man. Teens need to learn to develop sociologically. And I'm going to tell you, I really believe, in fact, the older I get, I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm old, but I really think it's because I've lived a little longer, I've seen a little more now, and I'm thinking that development begins with parents 
and grandparents. Because as your teenager grows, they're not just going to ask, who am I? They're going to ask, who are these other people? And mom and dad, that's going to start with you. They have a very narrow understanding of you when they're five. They're, they're incapable of having a wider understanding. But now they're going to start thinking, you know, who, who are these parents and why do they think as they do? Now, the way this comes out sometimes can be disturbing for parents. And sometimes it does come out in, in snarky, kind of disrespectful ways that need to be corrected. But oftentimes, moms and dads, listen to me, what presents as disrespect is often just that, that wait a minute, who are these people? And why do they think like they do? And, and why, they, they, have you noticed yet, this is why, this is the, the, the language is the same as it was when they were five, but this is not a five-year-old's why anymore, is it? This is a 14-year-old's why, a 15-year-old's why? And, and do you remember last week when I told you when they're four, when they're five, because I said so is an absolutely reasonable response? When they're 14 and 15, by and large, that's no longer true because they're trying to figure things out, right? And I get it. Sometimes it comes across. I mean, from the time I was 18 and probably, probably until the time I was 25, my dad was the dumbest man alive. But from the moment of 25 forward, He's a genius, right? We, we all have to learn some things the hard way, learn some things by experience. But, but I will also tell you, remembering what I could remember about those years, that, that I, I never lost respect for my father, never. I just asked these questions. And so more than likely, they're just asking questions. And it's okay for a kid that age to do that. It is also okay, okay, for you to remind the kid at that age, given the culture in which we live, that they're still living under your roof and eating your food and wearing your clothes. So they need to follow your instructions. But this stage of development, man, there's huge questions about life and meaning that deserve an answer. And, and that includes, by the way, is my parents' faith my faith? Don't be afraid of that question either. In fact, encourage it. Because far better they ask that question now and God willing under the power of the Holy Spirit settle on being a follower of Jesus themselves than that they merely ride mama and daddy's coattails until they have a midlife crisis and chuck it all. Let them ask the questions. Your relationship with your teen will develop in a healthy way if those questions along with the young man and young woman asking them is dignified and answered and explored together. Yeah, sometimes every bit of that is couched in sass. I get it. Couched in sarcasm. Keep it coming, okay? Because what that does is it helps them develop socially. And this is the tragic irony. Our, our culture has trained us to think that kids get this from other kids. The well-documented history of the modern high school should put that to bed, okay? And there's a lot of great things about the high school and that model, but sometimes we forget that model's only been around for 80 years. It's, a, it's an infant in terms of the, the wider view of human civilization and even education and pedagogy. This, this idea of the high school that says what they need to do is get it together with a bunch of kids their own age, so they're learning together with kids their own age, and they're socializing with kids their own age. And then we exported that to the church and to the family and to the soccer field and the football field. And this, and this is why so many of you, that you got 300,000 miles on that many van and you're not getting any sleep what, what's the matter they got to go socialize again here's an idea rather than have them always spend time with people they're going to be working with when they're adults teach them to relate to the people they're going to be working for starting with parents starting with grandparents starting with with individuals who are at a different phase of life and teach them how to talk to adults as adults if for no other reason, again, then these are the people who will give them jobs. And those conversations need to push them toward God's favor. Your teens, whether they realize it or not, are pondering and asking these deep theological questions. And the amazing discovery about Jesus' own knowledge here in this text is often discovered in our own teens if we're paying attention. It's why they need to be brought to church regularly, and it's why they need to be given opportunities to lead. They need to be integrated into the body. If they mess something up, get over it because they, they need to learn. 
They, they need to learn. And in that environment, they, they learn trust. Hey, they let me screw this up, and they're still letting me do it. it. Hey, I can trust these people. I've got questions now. And let them ask the questions. And if you don't know the answer to the questions, that's totally fine. And it, it's just wickedly ironic to me that at, when some, at this moment of development, when the most substantive questions are part of their consciousness, most youth ministries are focused on entertainment and even more socialization. Well, you need this for my, I need this for my kid. I need to, let me tell you what your kid needs. And this is not going to be popular at all. When they come to church, they need more argument, more evidence, more Bible, more theology, more doctrine. That, that's what they need. Well, I don't know if they can do that. They can do trig. You don't think they can understand theology? They can order coffee from Starbucks. I can't do that half the time. Well, you want whip, no whip, latte, this, that, and the other, Americano. I don't know, am I in America? I, th I just want a cup of coffee. My kids walk up and I want this, 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 this. And it's like they're freak freaking speaking a foreign language. And I'm like, I don't know what that was, but it looks good. If they can do that. If they can game with the hand-eye coordination of somebody that, as I look at that and go, man, I'm from the Pac-Man generation. I don't, I don't even get that. They can learn theological language. You know, it's funny, and I was encouraged as, as to what Pastor Chris is doing with our teens on Wednesday night. And, and I, I, I asked my kids, what was it about? And, of course, you know what the, the first question is. Oh, I don't remember, you know. But the more we dug, the more we realized, oh, okay, okay. There, he's, Chris is talking to our teens about the two distinct natures within the one person of Jesus, the divine and the human. And you think, well, what good would that do? It's going to do a lot of good. If you're telling people to center their entire lives around the person of Jesus, it would kind of help to know who he is. It would kind of help to know that when you bring him your sexual brokenness and when you bring him your financial brokenness and when you bring him all of these things in a life that's messed up, in a culture that's telling you to stay in the swamp, that he's God and man. That makes a difference. That makes a far greater difference than any kind of activity. And they have fun activities on Wednesdays. This, this is what we've learned. The statistics bear this out longitudinally. Churches who focus primarily, let's just get them together, let's just get them socializing, let's just make sure they have fun, and we want them to have fun. But churches that focus on those things see a lot more young people bail after they graduate high school. I mean, what difference does it make? Plus, WVU's got a rock climbing wall, an Olympic-sized pool. I mean, we can't compete with that, right? Give them what they need. This stage of development is the most important time for our teens to be immersed in the body for all ages. So socially, favor with God and man. Then physically, Jesus increased, and so should your teen, in stature. Now, if you buy clothing, you know this isn't something we have to ensure. Is it? it just happens. They get taller, their feet get bigger, their voice starts to change. Uh, their clothes sometimes don't fit anymore after two or three months. And you got to figure out how you're going to go get more clothes. They are going to grow. The question is, how, how well will they grow because of our influence? And that, that involves several areas, starting with diet and exercise. And this is tough, especially when you're a parent, because let's be honest, as parents, we don't often get this right either. And when I think about my children's eating habits, and more particularly when I think about their metabolism, I don't know about you, but the first feeling that comes to my mind is envy. And, and then I have to repent. I mean, I watch my 13-year-old, my 17-year-old, and I just think to myself, man, it, I, I don't even remember what it was like to eat pizza for breakfast. I, I don't remember what it was like to eat sheets, french fries after 11 o'clock at night. I mean, I... And I love me some sheets, but I'm going to tell you something. If I had eaten a sheets hot dog after 11 o'clock last night, Pastor Chris would be preaching this morning. That, that's, the, 
that's what happens to a body this age, right? So you look at them. Now, here's the, here's the thing. Let them have fun. Let them eat the fries. Let them eat the pap. But on a regular basis, probably ought to watch that because, as you and I all know from experience, that metabolism is going to slow down eventually, isn't it? And they may run into some things around their, not just their weight, but just around their health that might not be good for them. Those habits will follow them. So let's think about things like diet and exercise. Let's think about their sexuality. Yeah, I know, that's weird. It's awkward. And we're in a tough spot right now, particularly as, as followers of Jesus. Because as I've already mentioned, there's a widening gap now between adolescence and marriage. We know that. And that, that part of that widening is not all wrong. But I, I think about in the 18th century, Bach, when he was choir master in Leipzig, wrote letters to the parents of his male choir boys. And he said, you need to be prepared for your son to age out of the choir by the age of 17. And you know why it was 17? He said, by the age of 17, their voice will have changed. It will be deeper. They'll no longer be able to sing in the boys' choir. 17. All right. So it's been a couple hundred years. And largely, experts tell us, because of far better nutrition and health care, the voice and lots of other things start to change a lot earlier, okay? And so, again, you've got that, and then you've got marriage and family kind of widening. And so you've got the awakening of sexuality and, and God's good intention for it doing this, and you've got God's good intention in marriage doing this. You see, you see the issue? It's not inherently wrong. It's just something we have to be aware of, that that gap is widening, and, and that makes this subject critical. God created your son, your daughter, as a sexual being with sexual appetites, and that too is an inherently good thing. Don't get awkward. Don't get weird. In fact, make them feel awkward and weird. Tell them it's a good thing. All right. This, this is, when you start with sex, as a don't do it, don't do it, don't. Fear-mongering never produced purity in a single soul. Not one. It's, it's good. God has guardrails around it. God has some intention for it. And when it's exercised in a way that honors God, it's a great thing. But, but they need you. And if you're not quite sure how to do it, I know lots of parents, I'm a, I like being funny. I'm, well, my wife will probably tell you, I don't have a lot of shame. I, this isn't hard for me, okay? I know for some parents, it's incredibly hard. You don't know how to talk about it. And it, it, I understand it, that it. You don't have to change who you are. You don't have to become like me or anybody else for that matter. But, but this is something that's got to get done. And if you need resources for that, we've got them. Just reach out to us. Right. We got all kinds of stuff. We got a book that starts when they're three. And all it does is deal with parts of their body. That's all it does. And the title of it is God Made All of Me. And it's a phenomenal book. It just deals with everything from head to toe. These are the parts of my body. God made them all. They're all good. There's also a chapter in there that deals with how certain parts of your body, if it's not mom or dad changing a diaper or a doctor examining you, are nobody else's business. And you want to start that really early as well, right? I know this, this stuff can be really weird, but, but get it started. Get it started early. And here's why. If they don't get this from you, they will get it from somewhere else. And you may or may not know where that source is. So their physical, sexual development, their, their, their experimentation, all of that is inevitable. Okay? That they will honor the Lord in how this happens is not inevitable. So parents... Help them grow, not just in, in social favor with God and man, but in stature. And then all of this, the umbrella over all of this is wisdom. Jesus grew in wisdom. Our children need to grow in wisdom. Some of this is so practical, it's not even exclusively Christian. In fact, the advance of brain science has demonstrated that the adolescent brain, this will surprise no one in this room, uh, the adolescent brain, particularly the male one, presents a mismatch between risk and reality. All right, the words, hey, y'all, watch this, tend to come out of the mouths of males who haven't yet reached the age of 25 because that's the age at which the prefrontal cortex of your brain is fully formed. That, just for your information, is the part of the brain that controls rational decision-making. 
This explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and so we know this. They need to grow in, in wisdom. They need, to be, they need some guidance in those early years. But, but, but what's in view here, this growth in wisdom is far deeper even than making wise decisions. This wisdom we want is the wisdom into which Scripture says Christ grew. And, and, and this is what we know of this wisdom. In Colossians 2, Paul tells us of Christ. It is him in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's no greater gift you could give to your child. You could give them a car. You can give them a college education. You can, than to help them develop the mind of Christ as it oversees all of this. The embodiment of wisdom is Jesus Christ. Everything else in their development needs to be formed by and emerge from Christ-centered wisdom. And in order to do that, you're going to have to do a lot of groundwork that our culture used to do but doesn't do anymore. Okay, So you can, you can go culture warrior and start blaming institutions, or you can just do what you're supposed to do as a parent. You, you can do one of the two. All right? You can just admit, all right, those milestones aren't there. How do we create milestones so that this is no longer a swamp? I got a great example for you. doesn't even come from, from our tribe. It comes from our Jewish neighbors. They have this amazing tradition called the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah. You've heard of this, right? Child gets to be a certain age. There's all this celebration around them. They've reached a certain age of development. I, and I got interested at one point, particularly as we got involved uh, on the opioid front with our friends at Addis Israel. And I said, I wonder where that came from. And so I started looking it up. I said, because I don't remember reading about that in the Old Testament. Is that Talmudic? Is that something, you know, some other source? And, and so I went back through and read it again. Didn't find it in the patriarchal period. Didn't find it in the, the Mosaic period. Didn't find it in either the first or the second Golden Ages or second Temple Judaism. The Bar Mitzvah shows up around the midpoint of the last millennium or in the 1500s in Eastern Europe. So that's how relatively recent it is. And it came about as a reaction. There was a shortage of men in that day, which meant there was no minion, which our Jewish friends requires. They, 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 they describe that. That's the word they use to describe the, the required number of men to pray, plague, another wave of persecution that our Jewish neighbors have experienced over and over and over throughout their history meant that there weren't enough men. That meant that those corporate prayers could not be prayed. And so the rabbis got together and they said, how do we promote the younger men? How do we bring them up? And as you can imagine, Bible scholars, huge argument over this question. When does a boy become a man? And the rabbis settled on 13 years and a day. I don't know where the day came from, but that might be a question for, for Rabbi Aaron sometime when he's visiting with us. 13 years and a day. Uh, so one day after his 13th birthday, a young boy would walk into that minion and with a voice that probably at that point was still moving back and forth between Barry White and Cindy Brady, <laughs> declare with confidence, today I am a man. Two things were true in that moment. Number one, nobody in that room believed it. <laughs> nobody. But you know what else happened? Everybody recognized this is good. It is a good thing that you say this. It is good that we hear it. And from this moment forward, you will stand with the men. And now he's along for the ride. Right? I love that. It doesn't have to look that way. But just in your home, even in our church, as we start to conceptualize, what is this? we have a few of these things when they graduate high school, when they accomplish certain kinds of things, we recognize them. Sometimes it's on this stage, sometimes it's in the great room, just within the confines of our student ministry. But, but what do these milestones look like? And, and furthermore, to the teens in the room, let me ask, are you ready for that? Ladies, are you ready for a bat mitzvah moment? Are you ready to stand with the women? They meet tonight at 5 o'clock. What does it mean to be a godly woman? You may be 14 right now, but somebody's going to speak tonight who's beyond that, in another stage of life. What's it going to look like decades from now for me to walk with Jesus? What are some of the hardships that I might encounter? What would it look like, furthermore, for you to go back to school tomorrow morning, not as a boy or a girl, but as a man or a woman? 
and for your teacher to notice someone doing something, someone taking their studies as seriously as did a young George Washington or commit to your home today like a young Clara Barton did taking care of her older brother. Be ready to serve rather than to be served and to serve around the house without being asked and to come into the church and to do the same thing. How can I help? Because you, you're in the swamp. You're in the swamp and you're receiving from the church, from your home, from your parents, from your, yeah, the, the reason mom and dad feel like an ATM machine is maybe that's how you're treating them. At this age, you should be giving as well. And I, I can't predict exactly how those people over you in authority, the teachers, the parents are going to respond, but I can tell you this to you right now, especially those of you in this, this 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, our culture has a major problem. And that problem is that we have collectively failed at something because adulthood is not happening. Adults are not emerging on time if they are emerging at all. And the promise I can make to you at your age right now is this. If you will commit to living this way at 11, 12, 13, 14, you will have demonstrated more maturity by the time you're driving than many people in their 20s and 30s. And as your pastor, I want that for you. So is that something you want? Because that's God's design for you. Because there really are, at the end of the day, only two kinds of human beings, children and adults. That's it. Scripture doesn't allow you the category that you see in our culture of an extended childhood. Are you ready to stand with the men? Are you ready to stand with the women? And, of course, the biggest question of all, are you ready to stand with Jesus? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that even our own human development, as clumsy as it can be, as awkward as it can be, as embarrassing as sometimes it is to talk about, is a good gift from you. And so, Lord, I just pray that wherever our young people are right now on that, on that trajectory, that you would confirm in them their identity as sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that, Lord, you would put a path in front of them that includes some clear milestones. And I pray for the moms and the dads and the grandparents in the room today, Lord. May they plant those flags very deeply in the ground, very clearly for these young people to see. And may they respond in ways that they will stand with the men, stand with the women, but that ultimately they will stand with you. And, Lord, in the, in the moments of their greatest struggle, may they remember that you too were entered into a period when your body changed. You entered into a period when your voice was up and down and cracking. Father, everything they're going through in this moment, you have been through it, and you are the perfect Savior and leader for them at this moment because you did it without sin. And so, Lord, grant them the ability to follow you exclusively. And may their parents encourage that behavior along the way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.